Imagine what it would feel like to be dropped off in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a sparsely furnished cabin, a trusted ferry companion, and the small chest of supplies your escort could fit in their helicopter. And imagine what it would feel like to watch the helicopter take off, knowing that once they disappear over that tree line, the nearest other person will be dozens, if not hundreds of miles away from your location. Sure, somebody will make a supply drop in a month's time, but until then, you're completely on your own with what you've got in a place where 911 calls are just not going to be an option. For most of us, this kind of life might seem unthinkable, but every day, thousands of intrepid adventurers, scientists, and military personnel make it their life's work to live on the fringes. Whether in remote research stations, in nearly inhospitable environments, or alone in uncharted wilderness, or even out in the vacuum of space, there's some folks out there who are just built different. In today's episode, we're going to look at what exactly it takes to keep those people alive and what it truly means to be stranded when nobody is coming to save you. Any real estate agent can sell a mansion, but it's the talented ones who can sell you a fixer-upper. So we can only assume that whoever gets people to go out and live at the South Pole must be an absolute genius because that particular real estate really does not sell itself. At an elevation of 9,300 feet above sea level and surrounded by thousands of square miles of Antarctica's barren ice sheet, the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station sees an annual mean temperature of minus 56 degrees Fahrenheit and spends months out of the year in complete darkness. Darkness. Now, I personally would describe those conditions as absolutely horrible, but every year, over 150 people voluntarily choose to live and work there, including 50 or so who make the decision to spend the winter. In complete isolation from mid-February to late October, these 50 people carry out scientific experiments, conduct research in astrophysics and glaciology, and we assume they also try not to freeze. So how do they make it through the long and the dark winter? Since extreme weather makes all travel to the South Pole impossible during these months, and yet we really do mean completely impossible, the station has to store all of its supplies in advance and carefully track and ration how they're used. In the summer, the base is served by a tractor train known as Spot, which brings supplies up on specialized sleds. Anything that the station needs for winter must be accounted for on the sleds during the summer. The station is built on stilts in order to be kept clear of snowdrifts, but the weather must still be constantly monitored, and with exceptions for research, the people manning the station must stay inside. In rare, lucky windows of survivable weather, a plane might be able to do a supply drop, but that's about it. Inside the station, staying sane is just as important as staying warm. And unlike the other locations that we're going to explore in today's video, the good folks at the South Pole have the advantage of a fairly long list of amenities. A hydroponic greenhouse supplies fresh fruits and vegetables, the station features plenty of lounges, a library, an art studio, and a gym, and it's got plenty of relatively comfortable, relatively private sleeping accommodations. They've also got limited capabilities to carry out medical surgery, plus plenty of vitamin D supplements to make up for that complete lack of sunlight. Frostbite and altitude sickness are common, but those can typically be handled by the medical staff. Psychologically, people who've wintered over at the South Pole typically emphasize the importance of building connections and friendships at the base and pushing hard against the instinct to isolate or withdraw. The station's inaccessibility means that any problem that can't be dealt with using the resources kept on premises can very quickly go from an inconvenience to a real catastrophe. In June of 2016, two workers suffering from an undisclosed illness proved to be beyond the station's ability to treat. June at the South Pole is one of the most inhospitable months of the year, and although the workers desperately needed to be evacuated, the planes that usually service the station wouldn't have been capable of making the journey in temperatures at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Left with no other choice, the organization that oversees the South Pole station was forced to send a single twin otter prop plane on an exceptionally dangerous journey journey to get them. A similar evacuation in 2001, the first one ever attempted, saw the evac plane freeze to the ice once it landed. But in 2016, the rescue plane was able to get its patients out with minimal issues despite a wind chill of minus 113 degrees. Despite that success story, staff preparing to winter at the South Pole are still explicitly told not to expect any help because of the intense risk to pilots and personnel who might try and launch a rescue.
The inside of a nuclear submarine is a truly unique environment, one in which sailors must spend almost all of their time in dark, stressful working conditions, working long shifts, isolated uh, with only each other for company. American ballistic missile submarines are capable of staying submerged up to three months at a time, traveling far afield from the US or allied ports where they might be able to resupply. But even though the submarines don't need any conventional fuel, they do need other supplies throughout their voyage. And in wartime scenarios, these subs couldn't travel all the way back to port without reducing their value as a nuclear deterrent to enemy nations. Luckily for them, naval logistics are up to the task. Nuclear submarine resupply can come through four basic airborne platforms. A drone can deliver small items or equipment pieces, or a helicopter can deliver individual small crates, both useful options to deliver small essentials like medicine or a replacement part. Alternately, a Marine Corps Osprey aircraft could conceivably deliver fairly large amounts of goods or pick up personnel and bring them back to an American base or aircraft carrier. Finally, the Air Force's cargo planes can make some pretty massive deliveries. Which instrument the Navy chooses would depend on the needs of the moment. A submarine in relative peacetime might get a visit from an unaccompanied helicopter, or in a time of active hostilities, it might surface for a moment to receive an airdrop from a cargo plane with a full fighter escort before disappearing back to the depths again. When supply by water is feasible, submarines take their resupply from ships called submarine tenders, and it's their job to tend to the submarines. It's right there in the title. These tenders meet their submarines at rendezvous points, where sailors from both vessels perform a well-rehearsed transfer using rope lines to slide resupply bags down onto the top of the sub. Once those resupply bags are on board, the submarines are good to go for the foreseeable future, and once underwater, they're cut off from the world entirely until their next scheduled rendezvous. Much like the South Pole Station, life on a nuclear submarine is just as much about keeping busy as it is about fulfilling the Navy's mission. In extremely cramped quarters, with sailors sharing bunks and using their tiny spaces for multiple purposes at once, activities like exercise, card games, reading, and movies are critical, while subjects like politics or sensitive arguments are carefully avoided. Although the nuclear submarine force is vetted for mental health and made up entirely of volunteers, the rates of mental health challenge and crisis remain high. So submariners are designated psychological services at their home ports as a standard measure. While at sea, though, the logistics of mental health care remain a largely intractable problem for a supply process that is otherwise nearly seamless. The United States' Forest Service has relied on fire lookouts for the better part of a century, and in the 1950s, some 10,000 fire towers kept watch over remote sections of the wilderness in order to alert authorities before wildfires spread out of control. While live feed cameras have replaced lookout personnel in many parts of the United States today, a handful of towers are still manned, and for the so-called freaks on the peaks who choose to live in the towers, life alone in the fire season is both magnificent and starkly isolated. In what is essentially a minimum wage job, fire lookouts are typically granted a 10 to 15 foot wide tower at the top of a hill or mountain, where they, their binoculars, their compass, their radio, and any romantic or furry companion are all they have. Although some lookouts are, say, a day's hike or a four-wheeler ride from a small town, others are days away from help. Typically, the journey to such a remote tower is done on horseback, with an escort or guide who takes the lookout's horse and any additional pack animals back to civilization. Other lookouts arrive by helicopter if they're lucky enough to have a small patch of flat land near the tower to touch down upon. Once they arrive, fire lookouts will check in by radio a few times a day to report weather conditions, but in areas without cell or internet service, that might be the only interaction that they receive for days or even weeks. Resupply occurs on a weekly, bi-weekly, or even monthly basis, depending on the location of the tower, when forest personnel service might hike up to the tower with a convoy of mules or lower crates down from their helicopters. In the intervening time, lookouts are on their own against whatever challenges they may come across. Wildfires, of course, but there's also bears, wolves, severe weather, and a potential shortage of food or even potable drinking water. Lightning storms can be especially dangerous. But issues like broken bones, falls, or even infected cuts can pose an outsized danger, especially in the events that the lookout might become incapacitated and unable to radio for help. Despite the risks, fire lookouts are essential in preventing forest fires that might otherwise grow massive and uncontrollable before they're even discovered. And despite the solitude, or perhaps even because of it, many people are more than happy to accept a post as a lookout. At the end of a several-day hike, they're setting up shop in one of the functionally most remote places in the world but with the risks do come some pretty exceptional views.
but no view on Earth could ever compare to the view from space. And that's a reality that the crew of the International Space Station know better than anyone. But the crew and their handlers on the ground also know that there are no humans harder to reach than they are. Life on the ISS is incredibly fragile, just inches from the vacuum of space at all times, and everything on the station must be brought from Earth or sent back to it. Everything an astronaut needs aboard the ISS goes through mission control. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no Amazon delivery trucks. And because of the risky nature of launching missions into orbit, crews on the ISS must always be planning ahead for the worst case scenario. If a resupply rocket gets delayed by weather, or it can't launch, or it suffers failure during the attempt to reach orbit, they have to be prepared for that. Over the station's history, it's been supplied by the US Space Shuttle, the Russian Soyuz, and Progress spacecraft, the European Space Agency's Automated Transfer Vehicle, the Japanese H-2 Transfer Vehicle, and most recently, two spacecraft supplied by private organizations, the SpaceX Dragon and the Orbital ATK Cygnus. These days, the craft that visit the ISS are remotely operated, with maximum payloads between four and eight tons, depending on which one is going up. Once they're in orbit, the craft often spends days just aligning itself to the ISS, and getting ready to make the delivery. Every visit from a resupply craft must be planned far in advance, accounting for everything from launch schedules to crew member rotations to the ISS's rigorous schedule of scientific research. Companies and governments have to coordinate carefully about what they send up and when, and it's absolutely vital that their internal priorities don't take precedence over the needs of the personnel on board. Schedules of delivery are entirely dependent on weather and physics, and only two craft can berth with the ISS at a time. Not only do these craft need to have their internal space units, used to their fullest efficiency, but their contents must be vetted and checked repeatedly and balanced precisely in order to allow the craft to fly correctly. It's frequent that the dates of a scheduled visit will change multiple times before a spacecraft actually arrives, and the ISS personnel are responsible for their own meticulous rehearsals prior to the arrival of a resupply vessel. As for what's actually being sent on board these capsules, it's typically a pretty long list. Not only do ISS personnel require food and water, but all the oxygen they breathe must be brought to the station from Earth. The station contains sophisticated sophisticated measures to recycle oxygen and water, but recycling it isn't the same as creating it, and regular shipments of oxygen are required to keep the air breathable. The same goes for water, which accounts for a massive proportion of the weight limits on individual supply capsules. Anything else the ISS needs for their scientific experiments, spare gear, and comfort and personal items must always come second to those critical needs. And with 6,000 meals delivered to the station per year at a minimum, those non-essential shipments can be badly delayed if essential supplies on the ISS begin to dwindle. On the way down, the capsules have a somewhat easier task, transporting all the trash and waste that the ISS obviously doesn't need. But the trip into orbit requires an incredible level of communication, coordination, and planning, plus a good deal of luck to ensure that nothing goes sideways. Luckily, the ISS receives strong, broad international support, and it's unlikely that so many visits in a row would be missed that a crew would be completely left without supplies. Not to mention, uh, there's plenty of contingencies in place to ensure that crews can carefully ration and make do with less if they ever need to. But the entire reason that these contingencies can work is that the organizations on the ground do everything in their power to ensure that the people on the RSS are never put in that position.